Sheriff Ozzy Knezovich talks with community leaders about issues in the public safety arena, sponsored by River Ridge Hardware. Well, good morning for those of you listening on Facebook uh, and for those who will be hearing this on radio. This is Sheriff Ozzy Knezovich with the Sheriff's Report. In studio today, we have Sergeant Andy Stockman. He is the sergeant of our major crimes and domestic violence uh, unit. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about repeat offenders. Yes, we are. Uh, the consequences of allowing um, repeat offenders to continue doing what they do. Um, there's a reason we call them repeat offenders. And the consequences, sadly, in human life that we're starting to see because of the policies that some of our elected officials are very, very vigorously pushing and um, ultimately that price is human life. For one of the first things I'd like to talk about though is in April I made an announcement that we were starting a property crimes task force to drive down some of the property crimes uh, numbers that we were seeing we had seen a major spike that spike started sometime uh, last uh, spring out in the out in the valley we started seeing a trend and uh, that most definitely we started seeing that trend more and more as this year pro progressed and once we basically let a bunch of people out of jail that uh, that trend continued however uh, for some reason we have people in our uh, community, elected officials and activists, that say crime isn't going, going up. Crime's, nothing's changed. Uh, we can just let everybody out of jail, maintain the jail at the, the current uh, population that we have reduced it to, and everything's fine. Uh, you know, Council Pre President Brian Biggs has made that statement multiple times. Um, Activist uh, Carmen Pacheco Jones has made that comment multiple times, and they there's no statistical data. They they keep saying, "Well, I hate to break it to them, but there is statistical data that uh, we can point to, and we're going to point that that data out right now." So, Vinny, if you wouldn't mind uh, bringing up the first slide, the first slide we're looking at is the the crimes for. Um, all of the jurisdictions that the Spokane County Sheriff's Office uh, has. That means uh, Spokane Valley, all the small contract towns, and the unincorporated areas. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, those red areas, those red areas indicate increases. And in the unincorporated area, we haven't seen increases like this um, since 2012. And I may always qualify that with 2016. Uh, we're not quite sure how that year would have shaped out uh, because we changed uh, systems. We changed the reporting systems. So 2017 became our, our new baseline. But from 2012 through, we consistently saw crime, especially property crimes, dropping in the unincorporated area. The Valley, uh, has trended more down than up, but we did have a, a, a few up years uh, during that time. And if you take a look at the very far right column, that is the average number of the last three years uh, since 2017 of our average uh, crime for that, that three-year period. If you take a look at the next column, it shows what was going on between 2018 and 2019? You'll see a, a, a decrease in crime between uh, 2018 and 2019, fairly consistent, uh, double-digit decreases in crime. Now, let's fade over to the next column where you see uh, a bunch of red. That is the 2019-2020 uh, 
year to date. And, you know, if you take a look at the uh, burglary, commercial burglaries, uh, that's a triple digit increase. And we've had double digit increases in all those other categories. So that's how it plays out for all the jurisdictions. Very difficult for uh, people to say that we're not seeing any increases in crime. Uh, very difficult. Uh, again, we haven't seen this type of increase, especially in the unincorporated area. Vinny, if I could get you to hit the next slide. This is Spokane Valley. And um, again, you can take a look at 2018, 2019 totals. Uh, you can take a look at the very far right. That's our averages. And then if you go back to the uh, the left side of the data and where all that red is, that's 2019 to year to date. And again, you're seeing double digit increases and triple digit increases in uh, resident or uh, commercial burglaries. Take a look at the difference between the totals for 20 and that total number of crimes in those categories for 20 and versus the far right being the average. We're far above our averages. Anyone more? And this is the unincorporated area. Again, in 2018 to 19, uh, double digits decreases in crime. Uh, you flip back over to the uh, left side, uh, double digit and triple digit increases in crime. So what is causing all this? Well, folks, we let everybody out of jail. That's what it is. And, that, that, and that's not just because of COVID. We started this trend uh, about a year and a half ago with a new um, pretrial release uh, strategy. And we just released people from jail uh, very quickly. And it's had consequences. Last year around this time, and I feel like I'm stuck in Groundhog's Day. I truly do. I talk about this all the time. And, and you know, politicians like uh, Pre Council President Beggs and, and uh, you know, activists like Carmen Pacheco Jones uh, act like this is new. No, this is ongoing. This has been the way it is since I came to work here in, in 1996. I first couple of months I went to a uh, an assault and uh, got ready to arrest the the person who was involved in the assault was told by my FTO uh, wait a minute time out we don't do that interesting and I was like what do you mean we don't arrest somebody for an assault uh, no we just scratched a, a ticket and I went okay I said, what guarantees we don't come back here? Well, there isn't. That was 1996. I was, one, I was told a few, last year about this time that, uh, you know, these are anecdotal. Uh, folks, there's nothing anecdotal when you actually have policy that says a deputy has to call in to a sergeant to get permission to book somebody into jail, sometimes for felony charges. That's not anecdotal. That is systemic. That is the way it is. When we're out on the street, we have to call in and go, uh, can I get permission to book this person into jail? Can I get an exception? Get, exactly. So uh, not anecdotal. <clears throat> it is the way it is. That is the system. It's been the system since I, I've come to work here. The system's getting worse in that we are now just fairly well within 72 hours and, and – and people out on the street, the suspects on the street will tell our deputies this. And I'll be out in 72 hours, three I'll days. I'll see you on Monday. Yeah. See you on Monday. Uh, and it's actual. That is actually happening. That is not a joke. That is not anecdotal. That is the way it is happening. And we wonder why um, things are the way they are. We wonder why, um, you know, Spokane... Spokane County sometimes ranks number one in the nation in certain crimes. Um, it's because we allow it. We, the, I should say, you, the citizen, allow it. 
because we do a great job arresting these folks, but you've allowed a system to develop that just creates a, a revolving door. And, you know, we get law enforcement, city and county, we get pounded on because, well, we're number one in this category. Well, you're number one in this category because you won't keep people in jail. That is that's is the truth. You don't hold people accountable. But you have a philosophy that's being basically pushed down this community's throat by activists, by elected act activists now, that um, we just don't hold people accountable. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have Sergeant Stockman talk about some of our repeat offenders that we've dealt with over the years and the results of not holding people accountable. So, Andy, I'm going to bring uh, the first slide up. Uh, Vinny, okay, if you sure. can hit that. Uh, go one more. There you go. Okay. Um, and just to follow on with what you said, I'm, uh, we would love uh, as a law enforcement community to reduce the number of arrests that we make, and we can do that by not arresting the same people multiple times. So uh, part of what we're looking at here uh, is uh, particularly where I work, and the detectives that work with me and for me in uh, violent crimes related to domestic violence uh, or robberies, homicides, home invasions, kidnapping, those kinds of things. So the first uh, person that we're going to be talking about here. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Yeah. Remember I said Groundhog's Day? This is Groundhog's Day because last year at this time I was talking about this gentleman. Correct. Uh, first gentleman is uh, Jordan uh, Nippling. Um, and uh, recently, uh, he was, so go back to April 27th of 2019, as the sheriff is referencing from last year, he was arrested for two counts of assault uh, against some healthcare workers at Valley Hospital. Um, he self-admitted for some type of condition and ended up assaulting two nurses. He was booked into the jail on that date. So an assault third on a healthcare professional is a felony assault in the state of Washington. Uh, on the 10th of April of 20, or 10th of May of 2019, um, he was between the, 19, the 27th of May and the 10th, I'm sorry, the 27th of April and the, 20, and the 10th of May of 2019, uh, he was released uh, from the jail um, and then went out on May 10th of 2019, got into an altercation with his roommate um, and ended up stabbing him multiple times. He was arrested for attempted murder, first degree domestic violence because of the nature of their, uh, their relationship as being roommates. Um, so from May 11th of 2019 until April 28th of 2020, this year, uh, he was held in custody between the Spokane County Jail and Eastern State Hospital, determining his competency uh, for trial and to continue the case. However, during that time, uh, due to uh, circumstances sometimes that are beyond the control of the prosecution and law enforcement, uh, the victim and the witnesses uh, did not cooperate and uh, some of them recanted, which resulted in those charges being dropped without prejudice. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, so in order to hold him somewhat accountable, he pled guilty to the two counts of assault third uh, on those healthcare workers from the year earlier, back in April of 2019. But because he had been held in custody for 12 months between Eastern State Hospital and the jail, awaiting trial, um, <clears throat> he, was, he was released because he served 12 months while he was in jail. That was his uh, sentence that was agreed to when he pled and found guilty to the two counts of uh, third degree assault. Um, so he was released uh, and on Thursday, May 28th of 2020, uh, he was arrested for panhandling out in the valley being very aggressive uh, to get arrested for panhandling, as the sheriff was referencing, um, we have to call, or a deputy has to call the patrol sergeant. <clears throat> patrol sergeant has to get a hold of the jail. 
see if they have the ability to uh, take that kind of arrest because of the numbers that are in the jail and the seriousness of the crime. And basically, the patrol sergeant has to make a case for, we need to arrest this guy, please. Um, is there room where we can book him into the jail? So he did get booked into the jail. Um, however, he was released uh, the next day. Uh, charges were dropped by the prosecutor's office. Um, and with DOC restrictions and right now because of a lot of the COVID uh, restrictions, uh, sometimes it's difficult to keep people in the jail. Um, so he was released. Uh, fast forward to Sunday night of May 31st. Uh, patrol deputy and sergeant were driving through the area, uh, saw Mr. Nippling uh, threatening another transient uh, with a piece of wood. Um, they were not in any type of uh, domestic violence relationship. Uh, so they briefly investigated, uh, telling Nippling and the other transients that you can't behave this way in public, all right? You need to work out your, your problems. And by the way, also you're trespassing, you can't be here, this is Washington State DOT property. So the same night, uh, approximately uh, at 30, uh, 11.32 at night, so originally this incident happened at about five minutes after 11 at night, the deputies get called back at 32 minutes after 11, shortly after they were just there, because someone is calling in saying that uh, somebody has been stabbed at the same location. So deputies responded, found uh, the victim there uh, bleeding severely. Um, it was determined that Nippling was most likely the suspect uh, and developed him into a solid suspect. Uh, my unit was called uh, to come out um, on a Sunday, yeah, Sunday night at uh, 11.30 at night to begin the investigation. And uh, Nippling stabbed this person uh, th multiple times uh, and three of the stab wounds were uh, uh, tangled up in the clothing and uh, the knife got uh, stuck in some uh, ribs and so three of the wounds were internal uh, while uh, 13 of them were external. Um, so he was booked into the Spokane County Jail um, on the charge of second degree attempted murder uh, on the morning of June 1st of 2020. Um, so over the course of a year, as you can see in the timeline, we did investigations, found probable cause, did full and complete investigations, uh, had him arrested, um, and then he gets put into the criminal justice system where, uh, as is our system, uh, everybody has rights, everybody has ability to counsel and representation, and then uh, that is where uh, our uh, elected officials and uh, other people involved in criminal justice have the right to get involved, and that's how things uh, end up being sometimes uh, drawn out in times like timelines such as these and uh, he was actually arrested for uh, murder on that one yeah uh, that individual died yes um let's go to the next one Ten minutes. okay next one is uh brian riley uh so on uh april of this year um, it's a typo, should be 23rd of 20, not 30, but 20. Uh, he wrongly perceived that a, a roommate was taking money off of a stolen credit card that he wanted to use. Uh, he took exception to that and uh, turned around and uh, shot the victim in the back of the head. Um, and witnesses uh, drove, a witness drove Riley to a gas station, got out of the car because he was afraid of him. Riley took over the car fled from the sheriff's office, got into a pursuit, um, abandoned the vehicle, tried to hide his guns, and uh, finally apprehended after a foot pursuit. Um, at the time, next slide, uh, at the time when this happened, he was, there was already a temporary warrant in the system for a murder that he was accused of committing in the city of Spokane that he was under investigation for. Um, 
almost similar circumstances to where uh, uh, sh uh, shot, accused of shooting somebody uh, execution style and uh, trying to secrete their body. Um, and because he was involved uh, as a suspect in that homicide, uh, Spokane City Detectives partners, partnered with us when we were interviewing in, uh, the interrogation of uh, Riley. Um, quick glance at his previous criminal history. Uh, lots of felonies, uh, some DV crimes, robberies, attempted robberies, uh, riots, thefts, uh, escape, um, very serious crimes. Um, some what would be considered uh, less serious because they're not felonies, but they're still uh, crimes, uh, gross misdemeanors, uh, basically showing, I mean, if you have three DVOPV convictions that uh, you're you're not willing to follow agreements set forth by courts. Uh, moving on to the next example. Uh, this happened uh, in July of 2019. Uh, this particular person, Jonathan Anderson, took exception that uh, a female stole a purse from a friend of his. He took exception to that uh, and wanted to avenge that and uh, pulled up alongside the victim uh, and uh, we found probable cause in this investigation to believe that he shot the victim in the head um, and fled. Uh, the next day he was found uh, by uh, county patrol officers and the city PAC team, uh, led us on uh, pursuit through uh, seven o'clock at night, uh, traffic on North Division and Francis very dangerous, very reckless, uh, but we were finally able to bring it to an end after he crashed into a uh, stone wall. Um, at the time uh, when he was involved in uh, this homicide, these are the things uh, for which uh, he had felony convictions. Um, multiple felonies, multiple serious felonies, and uh, assaults on people. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so, uh, he was released from an eight year prison stint in February of 2019 and he spent time in prison for res burglary, felony DVOPV, first theft, burglary, trafficking stolen property, manufacturing of, of drugs, uh, all serious crimes. Um, this, uh, particular person, Dean Bellamy. Uh, he is uh, now deceased. Uh, however, preceding his death um, in 2015, uh, he was involved uh, committing crimes of second degree assault and robbery first and threatening to kill uh, a woman involved in his life. Uh, we conducted an investigation, arrested him for that. Uh, he was uh, subsequently released on bail and uh, as sometimes uh, these kind of cases go uh, witnesses or victims are unavailable for trial uh, and uh, we're not able to proceed with this particular case uh, however in january of 2016 um, we were conducting another investigation similar crimes felony harassment, threats to kill, uh, violation of a serve no contact order. And through this investigation, we we're able to see that the reason why the victim was not cooperating with the, cooperating with the original is because uh, she was being intimidated uh, by him. Uh, however, unfortunately, uh, that case uh, did not proceed as well due to the same kind of factors. Um, moving on to the final slide regarding Mr. Bellamy. Um, we were called back there again under similar circumstances. Uh, next slide. And on uh, March 6th, uh, he threatened to kill uh, people in his family. Uh, so patrol responded, started writing a search warrant based on the probable cause for, that they've gleaned from uh, witness interviews. Um, and Mr. Bellamy barricaded himself inside of his house uh, at one point during the uh, investigation involving a search warrant, the, uh, our SWAT team was called out and uh, 
uh, shots were fired and one of our sheriff sergeants on the SWAT team was hit and in the return fire from our SWAT team, uh, Mr. Bellamy was, was killed. Um, and final example of this is uh, Mr. Hart Charleston Harper. Uh, he was involved in a situation where he was acting aggressively, waving a machete uh, <clears throat> or other edged weapons around a sidewalk in front of Zola's right downtown uh, during the times that uh, people were there eating. Uh, he failed to listen to uh, the instructions of the responding Spokane City Police and uh, made advances towards where people were living and or uh, in the restaurant. And uh, they responded uh, to him not listening to them and following their commands with lethal and less lethal force. Uh, he survived his injuries uh, but was stopped from entering a residential area uh, and unknown what his intentions were. Uh, however, he was stopped by them. Uh, he was sentenced to 15 months in prison and 12 months of community custody. And he has uh, since been out and uh, has failed to, I believe, register as a sex offender. So. Mm -hmm. Next slide. One more. Uh, let's skip that one. Yeah. This one is uh, just very, very recently. Uh, as you notice in April of this year, this individual was uh, arrested for reckless driving and eluding deputies. He was uh, arrested on the 17th of April. He was released on the 21st of April, $5,000 bond, which means he got out um, with uh, $500. Um, and. Um, the uh, the bell bond project uh, helped him out with bond on one of Correct. them, uh, which is a project that has been adopted from New York. And when you start talking to people that are actually in New York and living under that system, they they will tell you that uh, crime is spiraling uh, right back up um, because nobody's being held accountable uh, and everybody's being let out of jail. Uh, that's. And New York took great pride in driving its crime down and becoming a very safe city, one of the safest cities in the world. Yes. But now we're going backwards because of the same philosophy that uh, is trying to be forced upon Spokane. Uh, as you know, that uh, this individual was arrested um, on a DOC hold, which means the Department of Corrections had a warrant for him um, for escape from community custody. Uh, he was. Um, arrest on that on the 4th of May by May 28th he was released and that is generally the way it happens you usually at two weeks for some kind of violation of your parole right. um, and if you're held at all because right now sometimes we don't even arrest them because um, there's no the jail won't take them and then on the 6th of June um, this individual was involved in a um, an incident where he t-bones a innocent person and kills them and he's currently in critical condition uh, once he's out he'll be charged with uh, vehicular homicide and those are the type of things that we see on a continual basis um, and the sad part is folks those are your friends could be your family members and this has become now lethal. I, I didn't get into law enforcement to watch people die. No. Uh, I really didn't. Uh, we got in, into law enforcement to protect you, your families, from people that don't want to live their life a, in, under the conditions of a, a free society. And there comes a, a cost when you don't hold people accountable. In the next few weeks, um, I, the sheriff's report will be back uh, mid-July, and we're going to cover some of the things that we've actually seen um, headlines in, in the paper, um, you know, about, you know, higher arrest rates for African Americans. I will be meeting with the NAACP president. We've been working on this for about a year on the 17th of uh, July. And we're going to talk about this, and we've already talked about it, and we've uh, agreed that we're going to 
make sure that we use researched data, that we use researched um, reports and things like this to talk about what is that actually going on with that type of statistic. And we've already combed the data for uh, the, the sheriff's office. I brought them in. I said the, I said the president of the NAACP and the press professor he brought it with him right next to my uh, analyst. She created all the data for them, so there's no there's no way anybody can say that uh, they didn't get what they wanted because they sat right next to my analyst and made sure, and we made sure they got exactly what they wanted. So once we, uh, we get through with that, we're going to talk about some of these hot topics. And we're also going to talk about some of the topics uh, at the national level. Are we really getting all the information that we need on these critical events that are happening in our nation? Um, and uh, the answer, um, maybe not so much. Uh, so we'll talk about those, and, I, and I'll explain what I'm, uh, what I'm saying uh, when we get back. Folks, this is Sheriff Ozzie Knezovic with the Sheriff's Report. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Have a great 4th of July. We'll see you mid-May or mid-July. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Ask the host a question, recommend a guest, or check out any of our other programs on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or SpokaneTalksMedia.com. Sponsored by River Ridge Hardware.